Sutta, which is a very high teaching of emptiness, you know, of emptiness and compassion, actually. And I might, I might give a little commentary on it after we chant it together. And uh, the Japanese Zen people chant it, the Korean Zen people, Chinese Chan people, the Song people of Korea, they all chant it, they chant a slightly shorter version, they did it in India for thousands of years. And one of the reasons that they always do it at the beginning of a, of a gathering is that if there are any negative uh, entities around, you know, spirits or whatever, ghosts, they run away. <laughs> they don't like it. For some reason, they don't like the Heart Sutra. And any negative vibes don't like Heart Sutra. They really don't. I don't know why. They just don't like it, according to the Tibetans. So at the end, we clap three times just to make sure they, they left the room. You know? Okay. In Sanskrit, Bhagavad, everyone chant. Now, don't just leave it to me, okay? Together. We'll just read it basically, but make a little chanty like, you know. In Sanskrit, Bhagavati Pradya Paramita Hridaya, in Tibetan, Chamden Dema Shera Parchin Ningbo, in English, the Blessed Lady Buddha, Heart of Transcendent Wisdom. Thus did I hear on a special occasion the Blessed Lord was dwelling on the water of Deacon Rajagarha, together with great communities of mendicants and bodhisattvas. At that time, the Blessed Lord entranced himself in the teaching samadhi called Illumination of the Profound. Just then, the noble Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, the great hero, was contemplating the practice of the Profound Transcendence of Wisdom, and he realized that those five body-mind processes are void of any intrinsic reality. Thereupon, impelled by the power of the Buddha, Venerable Shariputra addressed the noble Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, the great hero, thus, when any noble son wishes to engage in the practice of the profound transcendence of wisdom, how should he learn? Then the noble Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, the great hero, addressed Venerable Sharadati Bhutra thus, Shariputra, when any noble son or noble daughter wishes to engage in the practice of the profound transcendence of wisdom, he or she should realize it in this way. Those five body-mind processes should be truly realized to be void of any intrinsic reality. Matter is voidness, voidness is matter, voidness is not other than matter, neither is matter other than voidness. Likewise, sensations, conceptions, mental functions, and consciousnesses are also void. Shariputra does all things are voidness, signless, uncreated, unceased, stainless, impeccable, undecreased, and unincreased. Shariputra does in voidness there are no matter, no sensation, no conception, no mental function, no consciousness. No eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mentality, no form or color, no sound, no scent, no taste, no texture, no idea. There are no sense media from eye to mentality sense media, and there are no consciousness media from visual to mental consciousness media either. There are no ignorance and no cessation of ignorance and so on up to no old age and death and no cessation of old age and death either. Likewise, there are no suffering, no origination, no cessation, no path, no intuitive wisdom, no attainment, and no non-attainment either. Therefore, Shani Putra, because the Bodhisattva is without attainment, he lives in reliance on transcendent wisdom. His spirit is unobscured and free of fear. Passing far beyond all confusion, he ultimately succeeds in Nirvana. And all the Buddhas who live in past, present, and future rely on transcendent wisdom to reach manifestly perfect Buddhahood and unexcelled perfect enlightenment. Such being so, there is the mantra of transcendent wisdom, the mantra of great science, the unexcelled mantra, the uniquely universal mantra, the mantra that eradicates all suffering. It is not false and should be known as truth. The transcendent wisdom mantra has followers Tajata. Om Gate Gate Paragate Paratam Gate Bodhi Swat Murtan Om Gate Gate Paragate Paratam Gate Bodhi Swaha Om Gate Gate Paragate Paratam Gate Bodhi Swaha Shariputra, thus should the Bodhisattva, the great hero, learn the profound transcendence of wisdom. Thereupon the Blessed Lord arose from that samadhi and applauded the noble Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, the great hero. Excellent, excellent, noble son, so it is, so it is. One should practice the profound transcendence of wisdom in just the way you have taught it. And even the transcendent Buddhas will joyfully congratulate you. 
When the Blessed Lord has spoken thus, the Venerable Sharada Diputra, the Noble Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, the great hero, everyone in that audience and the whole world with its gods, humans, titans, and fairies rejoice and all applauded what the Buddha said. <laughs> Okay, so how many of you know that to have heard the Heart Sutra before? Quite a few of you. Oh, good. So, uh, just a little bit. Do you mind? Can I do a little commentary on it? So, there are several things just to mention to you. Actually, the Zen people and sometimes the Sanskrit people, Indian, they have a shorter version where they leave out the framework uh, thing about how Buddha went into a certain meditation. And then Avalokiteshvara did this, then Shariputra asked him. And they just kind of just start straight with Shariputra, with Avalokiteshvara giving the teaching. They go, go straight into that. But the framework is very, very important. So first, in the title, the fact that it's called Bhagavati, that's very, very important. You know, Bhagavan, some of you who know uh, Indian chanting, you all have heard Bhagavan, which means God, actually, in, in Hinduism. But uh, it actually literally means one who has good fortune. Bhagavan means, because Bhaga means good fortune, and um, one who got lucky, actually, <laughs> that's what Bhagavan actually means, and, but it's female, because wisdom is female, and um, sort of archetypally, although most of Buddhist literature was written by men and so forth, but still, because they were in chauvinist Asian societies like ours, but still, the archetype of wisdom is the female. And the male actually is the archetype of compassion, which is surprising perhaps, but so the two are together. But uh, anyway, that's why it's the female Buddha, Bhagavati, and Prajna Paramita, or transcendent wisdom, is a goddess actually. So this is her heart, this short sutra. It's one out of 18 transcendent wisdom sutras. Uh, this is the sort of most famous short one. There's a shorter one. The shortest one of the 18 sutras is just one syllable, which is the syllable of. Uh. And that's the shortest of all the transcendent wisdom sutra. Ah. Because ah, in Sanskrit, like in uh, English, it can be a negation, you know, like you can say amoral, you know, and iconic, you know, you can put an ah in front of a word and it negates the word, right? And, uh, uh, and so it means that also in Sanskrit, you can put an ah in front of something and it negates it, makes it negative. Uh, adharma means, for example, non-virtue or non-dharma, you know. But also, the ah uh, in the Indian uh, legendary, uh, the ah uh, is the first vowel. And until the, uh, when, when the universe is in a state of destruction in between its different cycles, you know, pre Big Bang and after Big Crunch of previous universe, when it's in what they call state of pralaya or dissolution, what there is around, lying around is not atoms, but syllables. But the consonants without the vowels cannot make any sound, so they're dead syllables. It's just instead of ka without the vowel ah, it's just a sound. <laughs> no sound. So the ah comes and creates the universe by picking up the consonants and making them articulate something. You follow me? So it's both a negation like emptiness, and it is what makes room for the universe. Like like uh, like the vowel ah in the Indian Indian physics, you could say. Indian cosmology. So it has that same double meaning as emptiness. And um, so that's what I'll see. Then you all, you may have heard before, they call it perfect wisdom or perfection of wisdom. But paramita means going beyond. So it doesn't really, it, perfection has the idea of something finished. Whereas prajna paramita has a double meaning. It means wisdom that has gone beyond. But that wisdom also went beyond itself. So it's not any longer some person with wisdom, you know, who owns wisdom. It, it's like, it's wisdom that goes beyond the subject of the wisdom, you know, so it transcends, wisdom that transcends itself. Transcends a subject, object, way of knowing, a dualistic way of knowing. Anyway, so transcendent wisdom is a better translation, actually. Although perfection is so established for so long, it's very hard to get people to think about it. Anyway, that's that little bit. Then the second, but overall in the framework, there are a number of sutras, especially in Mahayana, where there are a few in, in Pali also, but especially in Mahayana, where Buddha doesn't actually teach the sutra, but he goes into a meditation at the beginning, and then 
Well, in that meditation, bodhisattvas will teach it or someone else will teach. But the idea is as inspired by the Buddha. Because the, a Buddha is a being, by definition, who feels that he or she, or it, there could be it put as a thing, is everything else at the same time. Like if you suddenly had an experience, you were sitting here, each of us is sitting sort of inside the envelope of our own skin, looking out from our eyes and listening in our ears and reaching out through our senses into the world around us, assumed to be other than ourselves. But when you attain Buddhahood, you feel you're the whole thing and all the other people, which must be weird. <laughs> it's like you are everybody. So you're looking at yourself, like here, if you felt that, you think you were me talking to you as well as you listening and everybody else around, it would be very distracting at first, I think. But anyway, that's what a Buddha, so when Buddha goes into that kind of, here called illumination of the profound, is the name of his, of his um, uh, Gambhira Aloha, the word Aloha is there, the, uh, Gambhira Aloha. And, um, and, and so he's sort of sending out that people's minds are gonna move with him being one with them into focusing on the profound, and then, the teacher of the sutra is Avalokiteshvara, who is said to be a being who attained Buddhahood already, perfect knowledge, but as a Buddha, is it manifest as a Bodhisattva, someone on the path to a Buddhahood, in many universes simultaneously, out of compassion. So he's considered to be the incarnation of the compassion of all Buddhas. And the Dalai Lama, for example, is an incarnation of Avalokiteshvara. He's not just one person, he's one but say Kamapa is also incarnation of Avalokiteshvara, and there may be many others who are incarnations of Avalokiteshvara. When the Dalai Lama visited Monticello in Virginia in 1989 when he first came to America, 1979 when he first came to America, he said, I don't know about that. I, I think that I'm the reincarnation of Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> he said, I think Thomas Jefferson was my incarnation, not me. Okay, so then he, he so the, in other words, the archetype of compassion teaches the wisdom sutra. That's very key, because the the wisdom of selflessness and emptiness is it becomes the compassion for others, the universal compassion, which is Avalokiteshvara. Okay, then minor thing, Shariputra, who is the the sort of main dualistic Buddhist protagonist, meaning the you know, Theravada Buddhism. Dualistic Buddhism, meaning Buddhism that thinks that samsara and nirvana are two separate places, two separate realities. Whereas in Mahayana, uh, this is nirvana. You know, they're not separate realities. They're the one reality. They're non-dual. But anyway, Shariputra is, and notice he only asks about a noble son who's going to practice transcendence of wisdom, how to learn profound transcendence of wisdom. And then Avalokiteshvara answers him as a Mahayana universal vehicle guy. He says, when any noble son or noble daughter, he mentions. Because he's looking forward to America where all the best Buddhist practitioners are women. <laughs> and yogi practitioners too, and the guys are running in, running in the rear guard. And um, then he goes on. Then the other thing, often people say emptiness, which is okay, it's not wrong. But voidness is only two syllables, not three. <laughs> And also, it's not an ordinary word, and it has the same meaning. So I like it because it makes it, it's a special word, and you can use the adjective devoid of. So I like, I prefer voidness. But it's just a preference. That's, both of equal. But the other one is, you usually hear emptiness is form, and form is emptiness, is what you usually hear for this sutra. But form is a mistranslation for this. Matter is the right translation. And that's very, very important. Because, right, we think of, for example, an atom, we have the model of an atom of a nucleus, electrons in orbit, and mostly empty space inside the atom. So the hard part, that is the, the, the material part, we think of as non-empty, but there's emptiness around it. But we, this, this non-dualist point is that emptiness is this hard thing, too. Whatever is, it seems to be occupying a space, that's actually voidness or emptiness. And that's what makes the non-duality sort of a little bit of a mental shock. And why is that? See, then, because when we hear voidness or emptiness, we think of, uh, of nothingness or some empty space. And emptiness is empty too. Empty space is also empty. But what emptiness means is it's empty of any non-relational element. Right? 
And something that's hard and resists contact, for example, like this, uh, this chair arm, it means that, it's, that it is empty of any non-relational element, and therefore it relates to my hand when I pound on it. So that I, that's relating. So emptiness means relativity, actually, really. That there's no non-relative element in the anything. You follow? Which is what makes things able to relate causally and so on. You follow me? It's really very simple, but very, very important. And you get that from the idea of emptiness is matter. Matter is emptiness, right? Because matter would matter has to be relational to be to matter to be material, and to be relational it can't and a relational thing can't have a non-relational core essence or something. And then we would say, well, it's obvious, of course, we never thought it did, but there we're wrong because we do. For example, when you get a feeling that you are the main thing. You know, when you get a strong emotion, it makes you feel you're really you or something. Or as my old Lama used to say, everyone thinks they're there and, they're, and that they exist. And they're not wrong. Everyone exists. But the problem is that each one thinks that they really exist. <laughs> and that's, mis that's the mistake. It's that really, you know. In other words, there's like an absolute you in there, inside. And we can tell that that's so, like for when we lose our temper, or I, mean, I shouldn't say maybe you have never do, I have a bad temper, used to, but better now. But anyway, you lose your temper, then you get you act like you're absolute, you know, like whatever, you know, and you bang your head on a wall or anything, you know. So that's the key point. So when you're saying all of these no, no, no in the sutra mean, uh, you know, you take, he says, devoid of any intrinsic reality, you see. The five body-mind processes should be truly realized to be void of any intrinsic reality, or devoid of any intrinsic reality. So intrinsic reality would be a reality coming out of, a, out of an absolute core, intrinsic to the reality of the object, or the entity, or the person, or whatever it is. So that would, that would mean that there's something non-relational that makes me really what I am. And I have that irrational feeling. And the unenlightened person does have that. That's why they collide with each other so much, you know, and that's why they feel so nervous about dealing with the universe. Okay? And that's about all that I wanted to comment on the sutra. So, because we'll read it on every meeting. The only other thing is, when you first remember this gate, I made a mistake, I, I should have typed it with a Y, gate, gate, because of my disaster in Spain. I told you that. <laughs> oh. So when they translated by this translation, or a little earlier version of it, in, a, in my Essential Tibetan Buddhism book, mm -hmm. that they don't consult you these presses, you know, when they translate into a language. And so they, they translated this mantra, Om Puerta Puerta, Puerta Grande, Puerta Muy Grande. Because <laughs> they thought it was gate, gate. <laughs> so, that is gate, gate, okay. Okay, that's that.